there's enough blame to go around for everybody here, uh, but it does end on a good note. It ends with um, Tilly not being able to say the last word to a Rainer. You have just been fresh off a demotion, and you are acting so bad to everybody, and blah blah blah, and you are a huge. Boop. They came back. They found me. The glasses didn't do anything. Welcome to Janow. Uh, chalk another one up on the list of Star Trek episode names that are just a name. Uh, I'll list some here. There you go. <laughs> the ever-growing list of just an alien name. Uh, this is Janow. Uh, Janow, I guess, is the name of a trill. Last episode, if you were reading along with that poem that they found on Lyric, you'd know that their next destination is probably Trill. Conjoined souls, something like that. Use your, use your noggin. What does that mean? Souls joining together? It's Trill! So, you know, one would think that Adira will be very important in this episode. That's not the case. Really. Plot-wise, it doesn't really matter. This episode is filled with a lot of things that at first glance seem... Plot unimportant. <laughs> we won't know for sure until the final episode, but there's things littered in here that might be a red herring, quote unquote, that we're not going to know about till later. If there's any significance to them, whether or not they're important to be seen, whether or not it's a waste of time. You really don't want to be wasting your time in a season with like 10 episodes. <laughs> you know, you really want to be, you know, on the ball. So when you got a boring episode, it's kind of like, what are you thinking? And, uh, you know, so far this season hasn't been boring. There has been some... Season 3 and 4 had some boring episodes. Uh, Mind-boggling uh, in that these are supposed to be like a movie that's split into 10 different parts. How can you have a long, boring section? I don't know. Leave it to them to figure it out. This is Star Trek Discovery, final season. Season 5, episode 3, Janelle. Uh... <laughs> Listen, we gotta take Book. We're back on the Book train here. We're worrying about whether we can take Book to Trill. And I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, yeah, we need to take a uniform team. Remember uh, Season 4? That time you went to that casino planet? Or uh, a casino on a planet? I don't remember which. It was like a boat. It was like a gambling boat with lots of gamblers. Do you remember that episode? And I remember when I reviewed it, I said, Why are you guys wearing uniforms? These people said they hate Starfleet. I guess it's not a Federation world. So now we're saying it's a Federation world. We have to wear uniforms. It's just a weird line to put in there. Just don't put the line in. If you're not sure, don't put the line in. Don't mess up like more canon things. Don't just put in little details that, unless it's important. So they said we have to wear uniforms because it's a Federation world. So if it's not a Federation world, which it wasn't last season, the planet they went to, did they not have to wear the uniforms? And then if, if that was the case, why did they do it? Sorry to go off on a tangent here, but I'm just confused by a little line that was pointless and ultimately isn't a factor in this review, really. So let's get back on target here. Um, we're going to Trill. We're taking Book. We're taking Burnham. We're taking Culber. We're taking Adira. Sounds like a good team to me. We're on the hunt. And uh, this is our A plot. We'll get around to the B and perhaps C later, but this episode is, you know, a walkie-talkie with a, a little bit of a fight sprinkled in here, and I'm just going to be honest with you up front, this episode is more or less pattern-holding as per the style and tone of this season so far. It's kind of just a repeat of last week, really. Uh, we're on the hunt. We have to find these puzzle pieces to make a map to find a thing. So interesting. Well, hey, maybe the journey along the way is interesting. That being said, with Discovery so far in this season, I will say that the journey has been more interesting than it could have been. It could have been a lot worse than this. That's not the best praise in the world, but hey, 
I'll take what I can get. And this is the final season, so I don't want to get too mad at it. Uh, maybe you can, uh, maybe you reciprocate that feeling as well. I don't know. Um, we have this symbol, and uh, these map chunks kind of fit into it, and it's supposed to show some kind of something or other, uh, the location of something. Maybe that this thing that we build is the technology in itself. That'd be a cool twist. Um, maybe I just spoiled it. Maybe I figured out. Maybe this device they're constructing is the technology from the progenitors. One of these pieces has uh, trill markings on it, and if you know trill, uh, these markings on their head, they're unique. It's like a fingerprint. If indeed they are all unique, I don't know. I never look at every single individual one. Maybe I'm going to find another, another person has the same exact thumbprint as me. Hold your thumb up to the screen and see if they match. You don't know. Maybe they do match. Maybe they're the same. And this is all a bunch of crap. But I guess trill spots are all different, so they take the piece of this puzzle that they had from last episode, and there's trill dots on it, which are unique to this guy that was on trill so long ago, way back when, uh, when the, these scientists originally found the progenitor tech and then hid it away and created this whole mystery plot to make uh, an interesting season-long arc for Discovery when it happened in the future. Uh, this is Janao Bix, and uh, good on them for coming up with ways to involve all the different unique traits of these different species in Star Trek. It's cool that we had an android. They, they, they can live a very long time. He reads the book. They get the book from his mind. Unique and interesting way to get the information. This time, we're carrying the information we need across centuries through a Trill symbiont. Good, a good read into the universe of Star Trek and to employ the uniqueness of each individual species in order to get across a message across a long period of time. It gets the noggin joggin and it gets the juices flowing in my mind thinking where we could go next. What other species in Star Trek can be extremely long-lived or have unique ways of passing on information? Something to think about. And it's a good little piece of writing. Uh, this season has its own little chunks of interesting writing and interesting little story inventions. Um, this one in particular uh, involves getting a Siltrimbiant, which is like a little creature that you put in your stomach if you're on Trill, and you're one of these Trill hosts, and your minds merge, and then when you die, the symbiont goes to another host, carrying your memories with you. So it's kind of like you become the next person in this chain, and what you have at the end is a person who's kind of, in effect, had centuries of experiences. In this case, experiences with regards to hiding the progenitor tech. So we need to find this Janal Bix, Bix being the symbiont, Janal being the original host. Um, Janal wants to talk to us directly. This is after we solve the riddle. Where does the fourth point? I'm only asked, Guardian Z here. I've only been asked to answer the question. I ask you the question and then you give me the answer and then you can come down. Where does the fourth point? Beta Z, if you read that poem. I'm not going to go recite the poem here. Um, yada, yada, yada. They're down on the planet. Uh, I seem to recall a moment last time we were at Trill where it felt like... Well, Culber was at Trill before. Remember this? Was this last season or season three? Culber was at Trill. So was Michael. And Adira, I believe. And we had some kind of Jill Trill joining thing happen where they went down into that water... Am I dreaming? Am I having a flashback to an older season of Discovery? Do you remember this? Anyway, it's not important for this episode, but it's weird that we're back in this kind of same configuration of team members, along with Book. Um, now, before they went there, uh, Adira and Gray um, were sharing, like, hollow messages to each other, you know, like a long-distance relationship. Well, uh, in a previous review for this season, I had suggested that people were in a, were in relationships that were, uh, quote, it's complicated. Well, we got another one. I would have been uh, happy if uh, it turned out to work to be fine. Uh, Reno, for some reason, my favorite character, comes back just to tell Stamets that they're going down to that planet and Adira is going to meet Grey. And uh, she had a lot of Ractachinos. Sounds like she said Rakticino, but I'm not sure on that. Uh, 
easy to confuse them. Um, and there's something going to happen between Adira and Gray. I don't know. I'm not psychic. What is Jet Reno thinking? I, I don't understand. Do you understand this? I don't understand it anymore, by the way, when we get down to the planet. And uh, Adira and Gray have this conversation where it's just like, it's mostly just little innuendos, um, sub-vocal communication, um, you know, reading between the lines, things that I would not understand. So it's not it's not good or bad. It's just something I don't really understand. So if you understand the language of love, you can say, hey, Mark, in the comments, you're stupid and disliked because love is complicated. And I'll just be like, I wish it wasn't. And I wish I wish they could just get along. But but no, we're back to the it's complicated world. Enough about that. Um, if only we're we're uh, if, if only Mbenga were here to uh, rub sea urchin paste on her heads to get Janal's Catra to come out of the symbiont and go into Culber's mind, who was a human. But no, we have a trill ritual where they touch heads or something, and Janal's thoughts, which was a previous host of the symbiont, directly occupy the body of Culber so that the actor portraying Culver has a chance to, you know, flex his, you know, acting chops. And I think he did. This age-old Janelle character we need to talk to directly, an older host, about this secret behind the progenitor tech. Uh, he allows Culver to have, a, you know, an interesting, uh, you know, a little foray into a different acting, you know, occupying a different character. And I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the performance on behalf of Culver's actor, for me, it worked. I can see where this kind of thing might not work for everybody like it might look corny you know but for me it was kind of working seeing this different culber i remember i had a moment in my mind just like i had with star trek picard season three where a jack comes back borgified and i remember thinking can we keep him and when culber turned into janelle and acted totally different i remember thinking can we keep him <laughs> you know just despite the original post um, you know, of course, you never really want that to happen. Somebody just being taken over either by Borg or by an age-old Trill host, that is. Um, they go on a, a meandering adventure around Trill. And uh, we need to take on, uh, we need to go on our next spirit quest to find this piece of the puzzle for the progenitor tech. And uh, I remember thinking in my mind, man, it would be funny if we got lost. Man, that would be funny. Because uh, this character in Janelle has a very, you know, a, you know, he's very cavalier about stuff, if I can say so. Uh, you know, devil may care. He's not really worrying if they're getting there. And indeed, we find out he doesn't really want anybody to get this progenitor tech. Smart guy. Maybe these uh, scientists who found out about this progenitor tech originally should have hit it with no clues. That would be my my thinking. But hey, I wasn't them and I wasn't there. So maybe I don't, I don't know. Um, we go on a walk and talk, which is basically... Uh, we'll walk where we need to go, and then on the way, I'll deliver exposition and lore to you. Sound good? Okay. Shake hands. Sounds good. Um, so these scientists, 800 and some years ago, they were assigned, they were Federation and non-Federation, assigned to figure out what's going on with this progenitor tech when they found it after the TNG episode, The Chase. That's fine. They find it. They have a... a a device or a, a family of technologies. I'm not sure what exactly it encompasses yet. They try to activate it. It kills an operator. They realize that this technology is very, very powerful, very, very dangerous. So they hide it, but they also realize it could do a lot of good in the right hands. Now, normally you'd be saying, why don't they just give this to the Federation? That's what Burnham says. Good job on the writing there. Burnham says what I was thinking, right? Well, the truth is the Dominion War was raging. Touche, <laughs> right? You know, good people can turn bad with the wrong technology, and bad people can turn worse. So maybe it was for the better that even there during the Dominion War, they just hid the technology as best they could. Indeed, if the Federation had it during the Dominion War, it would be easy if uh, the enemy forces uh, against the Federation could, could now see it and then maybe copy it. Maybe that would be terrible. Or, you know, perish the thought, the Federation lost... And then the Dominion forces got the progenitor tech. Imagine, right? So the the sensible option here maybe is to hide it. I w however, I would have opted. I would have voted for hiding it with no clues. But the uh, you know 
the gambit here is that um, one day, maybe that day is today in the year 3190, whatever, the, you know, the denizens of the, the known universe would have evolved to the point to not use this for bad. We're momentarily in peacetime in this, in this era of Star Trek. But Michael Burnham says, we're at peace, but... And then he says, do you really think that? Or, and, and then I think Michael says, I don't think it'll last, essentially. We're in peace, but we don't think it will last. So there could be something bubbling under the surface. We've already seen characters mention the Breen. Characters mention um, Tholians. So the, we're, not, we're not out of the deep end yet. Um, so maybe when we find this tech, we're just going to hide it again. That's one theory. Or maybe when we find it, we're going to destroy it. You know, just a thought. Um, we're led eventually into like what appears to be some kind of rock quarry. Uh, and there's Itronox, large creatures that are that can be chasing us. Um, there's predators on this world, and uh, we could end up being the prey if we're not careful. Um, thanks for telling us now. Then again, we were going to go anyway. Uh, Michael and Book were going to do this even if they were going to die, so keep that in mind. And they find the, the prey, speaking of prey, of the Itronoc, which is some type of dog creature. And this dog corpse, uh, this dog body, I, it, it, looked pretty, it looked pretty real to me. I was kind of grossed out by it. A little bit of a wince when I saw it. I was like, wow, that looks kind of real. You know what doesn't look as real? The very next scene. Because uh, we, you know, skip forward in time, perhaps a few hours, to nighttime on Trill. It don't look like nighttime to me. It looks like maybe they press the button for uh, day for night on their camera. You ever have an old camcorder that had day for night or something like that, where it's a thing you can toggle on and it makes it look bright at night, even though you can tell it's not night. They still cast shadows. <laughs> it looked awful. It looked very cheap. Admittedly, this isn't Earth. I'm not completely sure what night looks like on Trill. I don't know, but it looked very bad. Um... There's another one for a terrible effect. Uh, first episode, the terrible green screen. In this episode, we're using day for night in a, a zillion dollar episode. I don't know how much this costs, but uh, day for night. Uh, I mean, you can get that. Um, big box stores will carry cameras that just have day for night. Like, what is this? Where are we? Can't we just shoot this at night? I don't know. Um, again, to reiterate in, from something from my review for the first episode, Little things like this aren't really a big problem unless the episode is just terrible. So this isn't really that huge of a factor. Is it something that, for me to be honest, I have to disclose what I see? And I'm calling it how I sees it. And I'm seeing a kind of cheap show <laughs> as opposed to Strange New Worlds, which looks very expensive. It, did they pull the plug on Discovery actually like two seasons ago and stop like funneling the money into it? And they just said, here, here you go. You're getting 5% of the budget that uh, Strange New Worlds has. Have fun, guys. Is that what happened? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't speculate. Because honestly, you know, things like that shouldn't affect the review as I see it. Um, these creatures appear. Uh, we didn't know they could cloak. That sounds very dangerous. Um, so we're teleporting all over the place, doing all kinds of fancy sci-fi action things. Um, Book tries to communicate it, communicate with the animal, the Itronach, um, with his kind of telepathic abilities that he know he has because he was from the planet Equation. Easy to forget that a uh, book can talk to animals. I mean, I forgot it, but <laughs> then I remembered it when I saw it. Um, isn't that interesting when characters have a superpower that you forget about? <laughs> you know, it's like it's like it's forgetting something and then finding it later when you didn't know you had it. It's a nice little surprise. Um, it turns out that what we had to do all along was not go to that rock with that symbol on it. That was just a quote red herring. It was like a joke, a trick. You see, uh, what we had to do was try to learn to empathize with the creature by putting away our guns and walking up to it uh, just like this without showing any weapons and honoring the fact that it's trying to protect its eggs. Um, and when we did that, uh, we got away, talked to Janelle, who was just, you know, sunbathing on a rock at night, looking at the stars at a blue sky, and says... You know, this whole thing, it was just a trick. We were just trying to test if you had empathy. 
very Star Trek. Um, however, they could have just died, and uh, it's interesting that did they did they set this up and hide that map piece on that rock around where the Atronox were, thinking that they would be there in like eight hundred years? What if they weren't there? What was going to happen? <laughs> what if they just went extinct? I I don't know what could have happened in that amount of time. Um, my assumption here is that Janelle uh, actually found the real hiding place off screen and took the map piece out of that and then just placed it on that rock. Like it wasn't just sitting on that rock for 800 years. Filling in the blanks in my mind, maybe you did as well, I don't know. But and then he gives it to Michael and Book. Congratulations, you two people had empathy. You two people. Therefore, here's the map piece. It was just a test to see if you were able to, you know, evolve out of your, you know, tribal tendencies to just shoot something that you didn't understand. So we went from thinking nobody in the known universe, no sentient, is able to safely handle this progenitor technology to being convinced that that's possible by seeing two people. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Janelle was tasked with just finding those two people. If it, if it was just one person. If Hey, listen, we're going to hide this stuff. If one person passes the test, that counts for everybody, baby. So Janelle, you hide that thing on that rock, and you wait for that test. You wait for someone to find that poem, and then if they pass that test, you have to give it to them. Hey, that's the rules we made. You got to do it. And that's what happens. Janelle gives Book and Burnham the map piece. I guess you guys can have the progenitor tech now. Uh, we finish up at, at the Trill Pond, uh, which looks very cool, by the way. I've I've always been a, a fan so far of what of what they've been showing inside the Trill, um, you know, sanctums. Not so much outside of it, but inside these little rooms, it's it's, it's very slick. Um, we uh, you know, we we transition uh, Janelle back into the symbiont of the host that had originally given it to Culber, and we wrap things up. Uh, Book has to go back to the ship. Why don't you get your leg looked at? Book does get shot by a, a, a barb from one of these Itronox, and a, you know how it is. Ouchie, I hurt my leg. And then you just stumble around for a little bit, and you don't die. It's, you know, last episode, Sarah hurt his arm. Ouchie, I hurt my arm. Now Book saying, ouchie, I hurt my leg. <laughs> Movie injuries, you know, it's never something to the back of the neck that uh, paralyzes you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe someday something like that will happen in Star Trek. Somebody will get their arm clean cut off. <laughs> you know, like, holy crap, I'm bleeding out. You know, we can't just stumble around for a while and be okay. It's just a flesh wound. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> our B-plot is back on the ship. Uh, our B-plot is a bottle episode plot with Rainer forcibly being an introduced to the crew uh, on behalf of Tilly, who is appointed by, I assume, Captain Burnham or the Federation to be his chaperone. Great, I have a chaperone now. Uh, just trying to break the ice. Uh, Rainer says something to that effect to uh, Burnham before she leaves. You see, this episode is loaded up with little human idiomatic speeches, sayings that uh, Rainer has studied, and indeed, uh, they say on Trill, when uh, Janelle calls the little fake, fake out design on that rock a red herring, uh, a, a through line through this episode is human idiomatic speech, or English speech. Um, you know, we have these little things in English, like, uh, you know, uh, damn, uh, he, you're happy as a clam. So if I were an alien working on a ship that was speaking English, I might learn that phrase to impress people. Hey, I know what it means to be happy as a clam. Ha ha ha, very good for you, ha ha ha. He was only trying to break the ice. That's what we're getting here. Uh, so, you know, it's commendable for Rainer to learn these things. What's not as commendable, I think, is the performance of Rainer, and in some degrees, Tilly, in the next few scenes involving our B-plot. I'm kind of in the middle on this. I'm not on Team Rainer or Team Tilly. Rainer was a former captain, and if you've watched this episode, you should kind of get the feel for this. Um, 
I mean, it, it, it probably is that if you're, if you are a captain, you have a certain amount of tact, a certain amount of, uh, you know, personable, uh, nature, you would know that your crew is a tool and you actually have to know everyone's capabilities and you have to know them at a certain intimate level beyond what's in their files. Just a little bit. But you have to also have a professional distance so that you're not worried about killing them. Because you were the captain, you may have to order them to die. We all know this. Um, I think Rainer is falling too much in one direction on that. Tilly may be too much in the other. Rainer has to schedule a meeting with everybody. 20 words or less, tell me about yourself. Which I actually thought was kind of cool. Because it's not like, you could read that and say, 20 words or less, who's this guy? He's so strict. Well, no. 20 words or less is kind of an interesting challenge, right? It's like, tell me about yourself, 10 words or less, without using the letter E. <laughs> it could have been funny, right? And it kind of is a little bit funny, because it makes you think about what's most important. If I have to do it in 20 words or less, and not something in the file. So he does indeed learn little factoids about everybody, that um, upon closer inspection, it's not that crazy to ask for 20 words. Um, but being, you know, overly distant and overly strict with people on your first, for your first impressions, didn't Picard ask Riker um, to, t to make sure that the crew uh, thinks that Picard exudes a certain personality of like congeniality and, you know, a, you know, a family kind of aura. Didn't they say that in Encounter of Firepoint? You're to see what that's what I project, right? So captains in Starfleet have known that, you know, being a part of the crew intimately to a certain degree is important. Rainer didn't understand that. It seems weird that he was the captain without a certain level of that. However, Tilly uh, does indeed uh, have an outburst that I thought was a little bit uncalled for towards Rainer. These uh, interviews, these short interviews with all our characters go by. Uh, Reno, funny. Just a perfect amount of silence between them. Just enough to be funny. Well done. Uh, Linus, Reese. I don't recall him seeing a Waishikin. Am I imagining things? He sees Stamets. He seems initially very interested in what Stamets is saying until it veers off into being less about the mission and more about Stamets being excited about the technology. And then he kind of shuts it down. You can see Rainer change his mood towards it in real time. Although, Stamets is very gung-ho about this progenitor tech even says that this could eclipse the importance of the spore drive discovery. Like, two episodes ago, he was sad about losing the significance of the spore drive discovery in the face of the pathway drive. So which is it? Are we excited about replacing spore drive in significance, or are we, like, worried about maintaining, you know, the continuity of technology and that this one's just better and eclipses it? Like, what I... I'm getting mixed, mixed signals so far from Stamets in this season. I'm not sure what to think. Um, Pathway replaces Spore Drive. That's bad. Progenitor Tech eclipses Spore Drive. That's good. Uh, Tilly ends up saying, Listen, uh, I don't know. Obviously, Michael saw something in you, and I don't know what it was. And I remember thinking, Tilly... You weren't on Kamau. If you were on Kamau and maybe seen Rainer in action, you might think something different. That would be my first guess, Tilly. So Tilly is saying, I don't know what the captain saw in you. But yet she trusts the captain. So maybe she should just say, well, the captain saw something in you and that's good enough for me. I don't know. It was presumptuous of Tilly, I will say. But um, there's enough blame to go around for everybody here. Uh, but it does end on a good note. It ends with... Um, Tilly not being able to say the last word to uh, Rainer. You have just been fresh off a demotion, and you are acting so bad to everybody, and blah blah blah, and you are a huge. Boop. Sorry, that's twenty words. I can't. I can't finish it. You're gonna have to imagine what the last word is. Very funny. Very neat. Um, very Tilly. Um, is Tilly still inside the command structure of the Discovery? Is she? Part of the Federation headquarters? Is she a teacher? Is what's Burnham Taster with introducing Rainer to the crew? Uh, where, where, do, if that's a standing order from the captain, why is Rainer able to disregard it so uh, 
you know, with such reckless abandon. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's ultimately not extremely important. What's important is that we ended off with Rainer meeting Tilly at the bar on Discovery. We got off in a bad foot. He does remember everything all the characters said. He, he kind of runs off a little a little mental image of all these different characters and what, and what was good about them, like Reese and such. Oh, he has this eye for ships. He should be in command division. He wasn't ignoring them. It's just that at that time, he didn't think it was mission critical to hear about all this stuff. I and mean, he he's right. It wasn't mission critical, but it becomes critical when you need to win at, a, at an extreme moment of a desperation and you need to know exactly how to get into the mind of your of your senior staff here. That's when it's important to know them. Um, you couldn't really see that at the time, but we patched it up. I'm glad we didn't end off dour and creating a villain out of a new character again. I'm glad we didn't do that. I'm glad we both learned something. It's 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 very Star Trek. It's it's something that was kind of lacking in early Discovery. Very mean episodes we got, but we're getting it here. Maybe it's a little bit too too little too late. I don't know. Um, Rainer has been introduced to the crew, and we have a little kind of like debriefing scene where Michael and Culber are at the bar and talk about their experiences. And, you know, maybe we're looking for answers. I'm just out here looking for answers in the stars. Answers. And then Culber just eventually says something like, well, I learned this stuff today about Janelle, and that in terms of, you know, the spiritual questions, maybe something not having an answer is an answer in and of itself, essentially. That's a huge stretch for me to paraphrase in that way. But generally, that's what I was seeing. Um, but at the very, very end, we've completed our mission to get the puzzle piece. Um, we've introduced Rainer to the crew, in a sense. Um, Adira and Gray have broken up for some reason. I don't know why. Finally, uh, there was a mysterious character in the crowd at the Trill Pond, at the Trill Pool, who was there. They have these red kind of cloaks, these trail people, right? And uh, I knew the minute we were focusing on this crowd in the final scene and the ominous music, I knew what was going to happen. I guessed it. Although I only guessed it, like, I don't know, a few seconds before it happened. So that's not that bad. They turn around and it was Maul. Maul, our, one of our villains, villains for this season, was actually in the crowd at that trail pool and learned everything that we learned. So we're now on equal footing. You gotta be fast to be as fast as the Discovery. Discovery spore jump there. How did Maul and Lack get there that fast to be in the crowd? I don't know. Maybe they went through a wormhole. Usually if somebody gets somewhere uh, stupidly fast or nonsensically fast, we usually just blame it on a wormhole in Star Trek, but who knows? Maybe we're gonna find out next episode. And that's your hook for the end. Maul was there all along. We're now on an equal footing with the good guys and the bad guys. Although we have a lot more pieces to the puzzle here. Although, it should be noted, when you're looking for a map, your enemy only has to follow you. They don't need the map, they just need to follow you. <laughs> so, you know, there's something to think about. Um, visually, uh, the Itronox, they cloaked. They look kind of cool. And in, But maybe it was a cop-out to get away with um, not having to animate them that much. Oh no, I'm being chased by invisible animals. Good thing the animators don't have to animate too much of them because they're kind of invisible, right? <laughs> Is that what happened? Uh, we just ran out of money, so the Detronox are invisible. Um, we also have to use day for night on the camera. Um, there's not much in terms of starships to see. You get a view of Federation headquarters, and you look at some ships, that, and there's nothing really to write home about. They all look like the Discovery Season 3 plus ships that we've seen countless times now. You know, detached nacelles. Everything's kind of the same color, kind of blah. And uh, that's what we're getting on display here. So visually, outside of seeing the trill pool, there's really not much to um, hang your hat on here visually. It's, it's kind of mediocre. Um, and visuals are a core part of Star Trek, in my mind. You know, ships are important. I like my ships. Um, Sound-wise, we're continuing with a very TOS sound. It's just little jingles here and there. But a little bit of the jazzy kind of uh, TOS um, soundscape is present as soon as they kind of spore drive to this trill world. I did notice it. 
but it's not mixed very high. It's not rousing. It's not in your face. It's just kind of something that you have to notice if you're really listening. So it's hard to really consider it uh, as a really positive point for this uh, season or this episode so far. Um, Discovery in general sounds kind of bad, with a few small exceptions. I'll say that. I can say that now. We're in the last season. We can start wrapping it up. We can start We can start calling it now um, for things like that. Um, Plot-wise, what can I say? We're just kind of following the breadcrumbs again. Man, I, I love whole seasons of that. Um, as long as it has a payoff at the end. It's one of those things you can only really appreciate maximally once you've seen the whole thing. So it makes reviewing the individual episode kind of like, you know, kind of ho-hum. But uh, I'm trying. I will try. Uh, it is interesting how we're employing all these different Star Trek um, civilizations and how they're unique. That's kind of cool. I mean, we are having, uh, I guess, a fight between Navarre and Vulcan purists. Um, by the way, I actually forgot this whole plot. Uh, Tarina and Seru are spending like their first day together working for the Federation. This is indeed Seru's first day away from the Discovery with his new position. Congratulations. Um, Seru does look cool in his new outfit. Uh, after they have a meeting, they end up voting to not have a space station for this guy. I know you want a sp new space station, but we can't do it right now, so we're going to double up the ships and yada, yada, yada. Uh, they vote the same. Tarina and Siru vote similar to each other. Uh, Duvin or Davin, an assistant to Tarina. Um, also from Navarre, I suppose, uh, although I'm just assuming. Uh, I'm glad that he's not a yes man. You need an advisor who is going to tell you no. An advisor who is uh, purely concerned with the real, the realm of real politic, right? Not what you think is right, but what is, you know, baseline right. That he can get into the mind of your enemies. I appreciate that we did not play him off as a villainous character. Uh, Duvin brought it up to Seru that it's going to look, you know, it's... You're giving enemies like the Vulcan purists, I suppose. I don't know anything about them, but that's what they say in the episode. You're giving them fodder. You're giving them fuel. They're going to say, oh, look, Tarina is voting in favor with Seru. Ha ha ha, they're getting married. There, there's favoritism. Um, Seru says, you know, uh, Tarina voted however she thought. They didn't vote with me. Well, semantics, but um, Duvin is a character who is here to tell Tarina what her own enemies are thinking. That being nominally, at this point, Vulcan purists. Maybe they have separatist problems at Nevera. I don't know. Um... A very boring, forgettable political plot that only serves to delay marriage again for Seru and Tarina, becoming the never-ending plot point of when are they just going to have a public marriage? When is this going to happen? Fussing over the details, fussing over whether or not it's going to have any kind of bearing on her political career. I mean, it probably has to. A thousand years in the future in politics are still going to be rife with the same problems they always were, which is why I don't like seeing it in, in Star Trek. I'm just bored of it. Uh, if you find it interesting, that's cool. Uh, and I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we didn't have villains here in this plot um, because you're not a villain if you're Duvin and you're telling um, Tarina that, listen, your enemies are going to think this, so we need to do this. Sarah takes it the wrong way eventually and says, oh, maybe I'm having second thoughts about her marriage, blah, 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 insinuating that Tarina can't have the political career and the marriage, which is, again, presumptuous of Seru. I've used that word twice now, this review, I think. Um, but they do patch it up at the end, meaning that we got nowhere. Like, we got, you know, marriage good, uh-oh, political stuff, fighting, marriage good again. Creating what ultimately is, like, a pointless plot thing, that it might turn out that it might be interesting if the Vulcan purist angle actually ends up playing into the progenitor tech thing, when they go to, maybe in this, they go to Navarre to get something, and it has to do with them, that might be cool, then that plot point might be important, right? Like I said before, hard to review an entire movie when you're watching it in little chunks every week, <laughs> you know, you got to uh, you know, you gotta just look at the, just the facts. Uh, it, it's this facts. episode is a little bit void. I don't really know what it's saying. We have red herring, break the ice. I can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
I'm not sure what these really mean. I don't know. But maybe it's like, I mean, look. These scientists have found the progenitor stuff. They were waiting for a long-lasting permanent peace. Uh, I mean, you could, you know, ostensibly, the Federation here, were trying to kind of, like, mediate peace between these worlds. Maybe there's something there. Sarah's doing that. Maybe this is the search for peace. Uh, it's, it's very, it's... Blinking, you'll miss it kind of themes here. You really you really got to dig. It's not hitting you over the head, which is good, but it's also nothing. It's also really not much there. It's just kind of feel good. We're feeling good. Look, we're solving our problems by having empathy with the enemy, the Atronach. That's good. Um, we're trying to uh, mediate between worlds at the Federation headquarters. That's good. Is this episode um, happy? Or is it sad? Or is it confusing? Or is it, um, it, or is it just a stepping stone? Is it just another episode that we just get out the door and say, "Hey, you got to watch this and watch the next episode." You're not going to understand episode four unless you watch this one, which is a really silly reason to put out an episode, right? Like tricking you into watching it because I have to see how they got X, Y, and Z done before I can see the next part. Very boring and not becoming of Star Trek. But hey, this is the new form of television we got in the streaming era. Um, you got to watch every single episode. You got to stay on board. You got to stay subscribed. So you watch the next episode, the next episode, the next episode, that drip feed. I don't know. Perhaps we're devalu devaluing, you know, the significance of each individual episode. I don't know. It's kind of meta. But this episode, it does get across the finish line. It's not extremely boring. It's not extremely interesting. Um, it's not quite as good as the previous episode, but just by a hair. So, you know, to be honest with you, I'm going to have to go ahead and give this a flat 5 out of 10. It's there. You can watch it. It didn't kill me, but uh, it's not amazing either. Rainer's cool. Uh, I kind of like this Janelle guy when he took over uh, Culber's body. Hey, we're one step closer <laughs> to getting those answers. I'm Lieutenant Merrick, and I'm going to see you when well, next time I see you.